Okay, well, back there in Daniel chapter 6, um, if you will turn there with me, we remember that it's the place that they said they were going to try to get Daniel. They were mad at him because the king said he was the best and put him all in charge. And, uh, you know, the others didn't really care about care for that. You have Daniel 6, 2, where there are three governors, um, and Daniel was one of the three, and they were in charge of the 120 satraps underneath them. So Daniel being one of the three in the third verse is said to have distinguished himself beyond all the others, the other two governors and all 120 satraps. He was better than that. And the king gave thought to setting him over the entire realm. Which is when the governors and satraps decided they were going to try to take Daniel down and look for some kind of a charge against him, but they could find nothing. He hadn't actually done anything wrong. Uh, so they decided they would put it in connection with the law of his God and try to make it illegal to pray to the Lord. Actually, they did succeed in passing a law that would make it illegal to pray to the Lord. And Daniel did break the law. Because we must obey God rather than men. So in some sense, their little plan worked. And it caused Daniel to be condemned to be thrown into the, land, uh, into the, di uh, the den of lions. The lion's den. <laughs> the rain in Spain falls mainly in the plain. <laughs> there we go. Um, they were indeed very concerned and with good reason that he was going to have great power. And so they sought to destroy that. Not that they should be concerned about him having power, but they were right that he was about to become something great. And they wanted to stop that from happening. So they caused this to be written and the decree to be made that whoever breaks that law would be cast into the den of lions, which is a pit, and that the pit would be covered with a stone. Which is what happened to Daniel, of course. Oops. And in the morning, 619 of Daniel, the king runs in haste to the den of lions where Daniel is. He comes there and cries out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, king, I have done no wrong before you. And the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den, which happened. He was taken up. There was no injury found on him, whatever, because he trusted in his God. Well, this is an interesting thing. If you think about what's happening there, and the reason for bringing this up in a short lesson like this, it reminds me of Joseph. I don't know if it reminds you of Joseph, but it reminds me of Joseph. You may recall that he is also one of more than one in an equal, co-equal position, as in he's one son of Israel, 12 other sons of Israel. But this guy, he's just one, but he's the favorite. He's the one that got, that uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, that Jacob favors and gives him a coat and listens to him. And he has and interprets dreams. At some point, as the record shows in Genesis, the brothers decided they had had enough of this guy. And they devised a plan to cast him into a pit, which they did. And they left him there until, you know, somebody thought we might 
we should kill him. Somebody else said, nah, we can make money by selling him off as a slave, which is what they did. But they let out that he was dead. He wasn't. Seemed like it, though. And he also was raised from that pit alive. And he also was taken a slave into a foreign land uh, where he also, in his position of service, rose to be number two in command, control over everything in Egypt, where he also brought about the salvation of everybody there by means of the wisdom of God and the interpretation of dreams. How are they alike? Well, they are alike in that they were betrayed to death in a pit by their peers, by their co-equals who were jealous of them. That's what we mean. They were jealous um, of Daniel, the, the other governors. They knew that the king, you know, favored Daniel. They, they must have known that he was planning to do something with Daniel that he was not planning to do with them. And, of course, the sons of Israel, the sons of Jacob, yes, they also knew that, that, that Joseph was the favorite. And you hear a lot of lessons. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, you know, well, whatever. Make of it what you will. You hear a lot of lessons about Israel. Jacob showed favoritism. And you see the discord that is created when you show favoritism to your to your children and you should never do this you know and this is often the lesson uh and of course you shouldn't show favoritism to your children and the, it does breed discord but you are missing the entire point <laughs> it's not there as an example of how to be a good father that's not it it is a type of what is about to happen when jesus christ the son of god comes to the world because over in Matthew 27, at verse 18, at the end here, when Jesus is about to be crucified by Rome, he's being betrayed by his fellow Jews. And they are betraying him for a specific reason that is not escaping the notice of Pilate. So Matthew 27, 17 comes around and Pilate comes forward to lowball the crowd. Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas? That man was the lowest of the low, the filthiest murderer, terrible person they had in the entire jail. Or Jesus, who is called Christ. Pilate did that because he wanted to spite them. He wanted to lowball them. He actually didn't want to crucify Jesus. He did anyway, and he sinned in that. But he didn't want to do it. And Adam didn't want to eat the fruit, but he did anyway, and he sinned in that. No, the reason why he lowballed them and said, Give me Barabbas or give me Jesus called the Christ. The reason is Matthew 27, 18, because he knew they had handed Jesus over because of envy. <laughs> they were jealous of Jesus. They did not want him to become the king. They did not want him to ascend to the rule. And yet they knew that he had done nothing wrong. They could point to no fault in his life or in his service. But no matter, hatched a plan put together a pit for him to fall into and made sure to give him a little nudge, right? That's what you do. They did this to Joseph, who in fact was raised by God, if you will, from that pit to become number two in command and to give salvation not only to those who put him in the pit in the first place, but to everybody who would heed the commands that he would issue in Egypt. It happened to Daniel who also had been taken captive, who also had been cast into the pit, not because he had done wrong, but because he had done right. <laughs> and they were envious of him and did not like the fact that the king saw his progress and intended to place him. So they delivered him over and had him thrown into a pit 
But God stopped the lion's mouths, and he was lifted out of the pit alive and established in his headship over Babylon. So also Jesus was handed over because of envy by his own peers, though he had done nothing wrong, and cast into a pit buried in a tomb sealed with a stone on some supposition that he was going to stay there, but not so. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Oh, he did die. I understand that Joseph didn't really die and Daniel didn't really die, but they were as good as dead. Jesus really did die, and he was there. But he came back from the dead. God raised him again. He has power to do this, and the scripture said it would happen, and it did happen. And there were witnesses who knew him personally, who saw him after he came back to life. And it's not the kind of thing like Joseph or Daniel, where perhaps somebody absconded with the fella through a, a, a stunt double down there or a dummy or something. No, everybody saw Jesus die. And his death was such a disfigurement, a completely unrecoverable death, certainly in those days, maybe today as well. There was no way that he didn't die. He certainly died. But he lived again, too. You know, when you think about the episode with Thomas, the, the doubting Thomas, actually, and Jesus said, come here, put your hand in my side. You know, put your hand in my... Do you realize why he says hand? Because they're very large gashes is why. He has large holes in him. That's why. It is a terrible, terrible death and something that you are just not going to recover from. But by the power of God, he did. <laughs> so, yeah, Joseph's account is really about Jesus, isn't it? And Daniel's account is really about Jesus, isn't it? And all of those things were there to teach us something about the Christ. It adds something to what's happening in the gospel. Of course, an accurate capture of what happened. Daniel's account, also an accurate capture. Joseph's account, also an accurate capture, meaning they are historically accurate. That is what happened. Nonetheless, the gospel almost kind of functions as, um, as a summary, as an organization, an organizing text. For here's the spot that is, they handed him over because of envy. And you hang all the Old Testament passages on that. Because that's the case that's being built by the Bible to establish that this Jesus is the one that this book is about. He fulfilled every pattern, everything that was written about him in the law and in the prophets. So that's faith. Really, that's a faith builder is what that is. Far from supposition. And it keeps us from saying silly things, too, when we read the Old Testament. Uh, you know, people get twisted over there. That was a totally different culture, a totally different time, and you're missing the point. It was not written for us to learn how to be dads. It was written for you to have faith in Jesus Christ. That's what's supposed to be happening. That's how you're supposed to interpret it. So today, if you're not a Christian, understand that God has done all these things because he is saving the world through his son, Jesus. His son did take on flesh as you and I have flesh. He lived in the same kind of body you and I have. He just didn't do anything wrong. He never did anything wrong. But we've all betrayed him when we have sinned, when we have made other choices besides his choices, or perhaps we ourselves have fallen into some of these other patterns that you see where we feel a little bit jealous of God's attention, you know, or wish that we could just be right and not be bothered or whatever. That's playing right into what happened to Jesus. Those are the things that nailed him to the cross, you understand? So we're all guilty of that. Pilate was guilty even though he wanted to release him. He didn't. He did what he knew was wrong. 
the chief priests who were crucifying him, they didn't know. They didn't understand that he was the Lord. If they had known, they wouldn't have crucified him, but they didn't know. It was still wrong, though. It still cost them their lives. If you have not been living the life of Christ, you need to be forgiven. You're not ready for the judgment day. We'll, we'll help you with our prayers um, and by, with our um, um, provisions for you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. We've, we have made provision. We've made it. Uh, you know, we have prayed for you to obey the gospel. Yes. We have prayed that souls will come to Jesus and hear the good word when we assemble. Yes. But we also have prepared uh, the ability to have the water for you to be buried as Jesus was buried and be resurrected as Jesus was resurrected. So there's baptism where you become a child of God, a Christian. And you also are going for the dead, but you're not going to be dead. You're going to be raised again, and your life is going to be even more powerful. You'll be a Christian. If you are a Christian and have not lived right, repent. Repent. If we can help with our prayers, we will be doing that for you. Just let us know. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. If today you need our prayers or if today you need to obey the gospel, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>